I was going to uh, just mention three books. I might mention more as time goes on, but these three are uh, central to understanding what I'm going to be saying this month, and they're very different books. Some of you, many of you may have read this one, which is uh, The Chalice and the Blade by Rianne Eisler. And this is the, the book that talks about the partnership versus dominator model of society and gets the gender tension inherent in the matriarchy-patriarchy way of framing that problem. It gets that out of the way because it just says dominator and partnership. And, and she believes and offers evidence that there never was a matriarchy, that that whole notion of a pendulum moving between patriarchy and matriarchy is not uh, valid. And she and I are in agreement in that we both see something very important happening to human beings around the emergence of pastoralism, around the time when the domestication of cattle became a major concern of human beings. Uh, this great goddess uh, religion that was worldwide in prehistory is inevitably uh, a cattle religion. And uh, she talks a lot about this, and she talks uh, a lot about... Uh, early cultural accomplishments. Uh, she's trained as an archaeologist. Early cultural accomplishments such as uh, Çatal Hüyük, a civilization in southern Turkey that is important for my argument too because it was very, very early and achieved a sudden and extreme flowering of culture like nothing that would... Uh, I mean, nothing would rival it for several thousand years. Um, Mary Setgast calls it uh, a premature burst of complexity and brilliance. And uh, Rian Eisler uses um, dynamic theory, borrowed from modern mathematics, borrowed from uh, uh, Ralph Abraham, who I'm sure many of you know, to make cultural models. And so there's been a lot of excitement about this book among feminists, but what has been sort of overlooked is that this is the first time there was ever a mathematical uh, application of dynamics to human history. So this is a, a good book. She is not psychedelic. She and I did a weekend together at Ojai, which where she was wonderfully <laughs> generous and tolerant of my dancing around in the middle of her parade ground because I'm saying, you know, that the dynamic that drove this cultural transition had to do with psychedelics and that this goddess cattle religion had to be also a mushroom religion. And later today even maybe we'll talk more about that. The second book, which I think you'd enjoy, and I don't know, maybe they have, they have this at the bookstore. They should have this. It's called The Creative Explosion, An Inquiry into the Origins of Art and Religion. Now, notice that both of these books that I've recommended contain long passages about sudden outbursts of creative brilliance on the cultural level. This is very interesting to me because this is um, this stuff called novelty that we talked about a little bit yesterday and tracking these outbursts of brilliance and complexity in cultures and in our own lives is the way we confirm for ourselves the existence of um, this topological manifold over which probabilistic or previously thought to be probabilistic events are flowing. What Pfeiffer, John Pfeiffer, is saying in this book is he, it's a study of the cave art of Spain and southern France. And what he's saying about it is that 
you know, some of these things are hundreds and hundreds of feet underground, down very narrow passages, and you have to go through all these contortions to get to them. Anyway, he's saying that this was a uh, manipulated environment, that these were created and placed in this way to evoke very strong emotional responses from people. And certainly, even today, with very high-powered flashlights and nylon ropes and all of this stuff, it's a very big deal to descend hundreds and hundreds of feet into the ground. You can imagine people who had tallow lamps. And it appears that they went into these places and made these things, uh, and then only returned very briefly uh, on a cyclical basis uh, afterwards. In other words, they didn't inhabit these places. These were ceremonial places. And what he's talking about is the High Magdalenian, which is uh, uh, 19,000 to 17,000 years ago, when for the first time there was... Uh, bone and antler technology. In other words, the Stone Age is ending, and there's a bone antler technology, and there is this tremendous uh, outpouring of creativity, mostly vented on a depiction of these animal images of animals that were in um, a state of semi-domestication or balanced upon the probability of domestication. So what we're seeing are herds of deer and uh, uh, cattle and uh, primitive uh, sheep and this sort of thing. So both of these books point to unexplained outbursts of creativity in the human past and document them very well, but without offering a causal mechanism. Now, on a more practical, partly more practical uh, bent, um, and this ad directly addresses the psychedelic issue, if you're at all interested in psychedelic plants, this is uh, the Bible. It occurs in several different forms. This is the botany and chemistry of hallucinogens by Richard Evans Schultes and Albert Hoffman. Schultes was the Harvard botanist who basically single-handedly created the field of ethnopharmacology. And uh, early on, Schultes understood that what uh, native peoples were saying about disease and plants was very... Um, touched with folklore and cultural factors. But what they said about psychoactive plants, you could rely upon. And so he, he oriented his career toward the psychoactives. And through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, uh, he and his graduate students uh, basically shed light on a previously completely unexplored area of botany. And we now, through books like this, and you may have seen his more popular book, Plants of the Gods, uh, these uh, basically list and discuss the major psychoactive plants of uh, the third planet from the sun. And uh, if, you, if you need information, this is where you go. And there are extensive bibliographies. This is the first edition. It's now been issued in a second edition. But this is pretty indispensable. Uh, and there are a few other books, too. But uh, this is the one to start with. Well, so uh, that's just sort of business. Uh, people should be directed toward books that then expand the basis of what's being said. Does anybody want to say anything about yesterday and go back over any of that? I thought I would talk a little bit today about... Uh, see, the way I imagine this happening is that if there's nothing else going on, then there are facets to this thing. 
and they may not even appear to be connected to you at first, but I will just then choose one of these facets and uh, talk about it. So a facet that was brushed on yesterday that needs to be really brought forward and understood clearly is... Um, it kind of comes under the general uh, banner of the feminine, but from several different points of view, I want to talk about how the psychedelic uh, experience reflects on and relates to the feminine. First of all, a lot of this has to do with how I think of, of the origin situation. I think everything was set then. And uh, women, I think, <coughs> well, it, it happened like this, that there was specialization in these early proto-hominid and hominid populations. And it generally divided along the lines of that the women, because they almost always had babes at breast, were more collectivized and more traveled less. The men hunted, and the women kept the children and all that together. And the women were gatherers. This is the important thing, that the women were gatherers, and that w what they were gathering was food, and what they were gathering was plants, primarily. So that, uh, I'll, I'll show you something here. This is a description of a plant. You see, before the era of color lithography, botanists tried, had this need to be able to exactly describe and differentiate plants one from another. So here is just a bit of a description of a plant. The plant is uh, Mathistica dendrum amnesium, and this is what is called the taxonomic description. Tree, up to 25 feet in height, leaves membranaceous, dark green, very narrowly ligulate, apically acuminate, basically long attenuate, marginally, commonly subundulate or undulate, 20 to 26 millimeters long, 1.3 to 2 centimeters wide, minutely and irregularly pilose on both surfaces. Flowers up to 28, usually about 23 centimeters long, apically 10 to 13 centimeters in diameter, very strongly sweet-scented at sundown. Calyx spathosaceous, green, papriaceous or membranaceous, two to five fid with acute teeth, three-fifths as long as corolla, very minutely, minutely pilose, corolla divided two-thirds to four-fifths its length, usually with five lobes but often four or six, membranaceous, white, spathulate or subspathulate, rhombidiform, long, acuminate, and circinate. That's half of the description. Now, the point of this is the need to describe a plant puts tremendous pressure on language to accommodate itself to difference. That's what they're doing there. They're my attempting to create a word picture that will make it possible to tell this thing from any other thing. Well, women who were gatherers in this early situation, were under tremendous pressure to elaborate a vocabulary of visual distinctions. You know, you eat the thorny one, not the smooth one. You eat the one with the leaves that have the crinkle on the edge, but not the one with the leaves that have the furry underside. And this kind of need put on real pressure for language. Men in the hunting situation, had, strangely enough, uh, the pack signaling repertoire that we came down from the trees with is pretty sufficient for a pack hunting situation. In other words, you have 40 or 50 barks and yells, and you can 
direct, a uh, complex hunting operation. You don't have to have this tremendous stress on adjectives, you know. Uh, and then the major stress in hunting often is stoicism and silence. You know, I mean, it's not a rappy undertaking. <laughs> and in, to this day, uh, you know, it's thought to be a sexist observation. But when you go into villages of native people, I mean, they always speak of the chattering of the women. And this is true. I mean, women chatter a lot about the details of ordinary existence. This is what they are heavily linguistically programmed to be into, is the details of uh, ordinary existence, and especially in this matter of food. Well, um, where the, the way in which the mushroom fits into all this is that um, when the African continent began to dry up, it, well, this happened over a very long period of time, and it wasn't just a gradual phenomenon. There were glaciations and there were interglacial periods. But generally speaking, over the past half a million years, Africa has experienced a, a progressive uh, aridity. And this forced our remote ancestors down onto an evolving grassland situation. Simultaneously with all these changes going on in the proto-hominids, a lot of ungulate animal, mammals were evolving in this sudden, rich grassland environment. Um, and in the dung of these particular mammals, the psilocybin-producing mushrooms found a suitable environment. They are that kind of mushroom which is called coprophytic, means likes dung. And uh, the, the, the mushrooms used in the Indian cults of central Mexico are not coprophytic mushrooms, with one exception. They are ephemeral, deep forest mushrooms, an indemnified... Um, um, community of species that seem to have evolved there, but the exception is in the genus Stropharia, where you get this, these coprophytic mushrooms, Stropharia cubensis and its uh, conspecific species, and they appear wherever there are cattle of the Bosyndicus type, which is the Cebu, the humped white cattle. This is a very primitive form of, of uh, uh, Asian cattle, probably the nearest living relative to Bos uh, primogensis, which was the, uh, the prototypic Ice Age uh, uh, cattle. So um, this, the mushroom occurs then in this situation, in the, in the manure, well, the pressure on the environment is for protein is intense. And I saw myself in Kenya, tribes of baboons on the veldt, and they would go over and examine cow pies and flip them over looking for grubs underneath them. So it's in the repertoire of the behavior of these, uh, of these apes to associate these things. And the mushroom presents itself as a completely startling phenomenon in the natural environment. I mean, I've seen them in pastures in the Amazon the size of small dinner plates and on stalks 11 inches high, you know. So we're talking a hefty, uh, a hefty piece of protein. The question is, can you eat this thing? And the, um, What happens, you see, when you uh, when you eat a little bit of psilocybin, and this was shown by experiments by Fisher years ago, is that there's an increase in visual acuity, very slight but measurable. Well, this means that uh, this gives you an evolutionary adaptation in the hunting situation. You have better eyesight than other members of your group and then you yourself had before you admitted this item into your diet. Well, 
you know, this is a self-reinforcing situation on a scale of thousands and thousands of years. Very quickly, those not availing themselves of this quote-unquote artificial augmentation to sensory clarity will be bred out because uh, there's just no percentage in poor vision. Uh, at slightly higher doses, the psilocybin causes uh, sexual arousal. Well, again, you don't have to be an, an evolutionary biologist to understand that the number of successful copulations that you complete has a direct bearing on the success of your reproductive strategy. And these are all numbers games, you know. I mean, those who fuck more have more children is what it comes down to. So if, if a certain dietary um, item is causing sexual activity, well then we're going to see more and more of the children of the people who indulge in that dietary item. And this can be very unconscious, you see. And then the third thing is, of course, that at yet higher doses it gives way to this uh, mystical tremendum, or this e entry into hyperspace. What this has to do with the feminine is that... Uh, I think the women would have been the gatherers of the mushrooms. The women were the keepers of the reproductive mysteries anyway. This cow cult that got going, it's very clear to me that from the primitive, from the point of view of a preliterate person, the mushroom comes from the cow. I mean, you can't explain it any other way. It has no seeds. I mean, this was puzzling to people up until the 16th century. They couldn't figure out where these things ever came from. They were accustomed to the notion of plants having seeds, but these mushrooms which sprang up overnight just seemed mysterious. So I think very early in prehistory, there was a religion which was uh, a celebration of the feminine, a psychedelic religion, an orgiastic religion, to take account of this arousal factor in psilocybin, and that it was in this environment over thousands and thousands of years that humanness emerged, an environment of boundary dissolution, of uh, uh, where erotic connection was actually the basis of community and where there was a constant exposure to this unlanguageable, unassimilable, uh, mystical tremendum. And there was, the, the psilocybin was acting then as a tremendous catalyst for language. Because remember, I think I said this, that it, its primary role in prehistory and in the present, possibly, is as to catalyze linguistic shifts, because linguistic shifts then give culture permission to follow and erect whatever edifices it wants. Now, throughout prehistory, this vegetable goddess is uh, a horned goddess, a goddess of the moon, a goddess of cattle, and a goddess of plants. And what I'm suggesting in this book I'm writing, and I should try it out on you because I won't, you know, you're the, my best shot, is the notion that, um, and I said this before, but I repeat myself, and also things make more sense sometimes when heard again, that the natural human condition is actually a condition of symbiosis with this hallucinogen, this particular hallucinogen, that the mystery of who we are and the mystery of why we are so bereft and why history and why all this malarkey is because things went on 15 to 25,000 years ago that we have not, that we have repressed and never faced the implications of, that we actually had a 
symbiotic relationship on the mental level with some kind of feminine overmind. And, you know, never mind all the questions which this raises about where is it, what is it, how does it do it, but just that the Gaian um, process is more than a process. It is a self-reflecting uh, intellect of some sort. How can we pass judgment on this? What do we know? The earth is five billion years old. Intelligence may come in many forms. Self-reflecting awareness may come in many forms. Uh, but what seems clear is that uh, there was a dialogue with this other. And there was balance. And there was wholeness. And there was a way of being which, well, it was paradisical. That's why we are so haunted by the loss of it. That's why all of our ontologies are the story of how something was taken from us. Something was lost. And uh, it's nobody's fault, exactly. I mean, it really has to do with the processes of the planet that this partnership paradise that arose as we came to consciousness in the cradle of Africa was dependent on the continuation of this extremely rich grassland environment, which was, in fact, a transient phenomenon. So that by 8, 10, 12,000 years ago, visible pressure was being felt by these populations in Africa. And you see, each time there has been an interglacial period over the last 100,000 years, uh, human populations and, pre and in the older strata, proto-hominid populations bottled up in Africa have radiated out across the Eurasian continent. But only in the last interglacial, 20,000 years ago, were those people leaving Africa true pastoralists. They had flocks. They had skin tents. They had a religion. They had language. We know this. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. Before that, they were uh, nomadic hunter and gatherers. So you, this relationship to the mushroom... And the relationship to the cattle, actually the first payoff was an entirely new order of civilization. The symbiotic relationship with the cow, which made life much, much easier, either fueled by or fed into the symbiotic relationship with the mushroom, which gave more successful hunting, better sex, and religion. So there were all these uh, factors feeding into this situation. Now, when these people got out of the Middle East, I mean, got out of, of Africa and settled in the Middle East, it was a much, uh, a much uh, dicier <coughs> situation. And if you know anything about Middle Eastern archaeology, in Palestine there is a great puzzle because... Uh, before 9,500, it's virtually empty. This is the interglacial. Uh, ice reached as far south as Sidon in Lebanon. And this area was all frozen up. But, but as the, as the glaciers retreated, suddenly there are people at Ein Sabah and later at Jericho and at several places. And it's always been assumed that by uh, archaeologists on basically chauvinistic grounds that this must have been an outpost of old Europe, the, the Balkan Yugoslavian area that Maria Gambutis has written so much about. Because these people are so advanced, they're called Natufians, and they appear very suddenly in the archaeological record, 9,500. A thousand years later, they build Jericho, which is, that at that time, the most advanced uh, uh, city site on the planet. And uh, But before they built Jericho, their habit of building was under rock escarpments. 
And this is the same style of Neolithic uh, building that existed in the Teselli Plateau of Algeria. So in the absence of much archaeology to support either side, I think it's reasonable to think that these people may have come out of Africa. And in fact, there is some evidence of this because there is what's called uh, uh, burnished Sudanese ware four <laughs> is found in these Natufian places. And burnished Sudanese ware four comes uh, from uh, deep in what is now Ethiopia. So uh, there was at least trade, and I think based on... And the, the people who write about all this have commented on the African motifs because uh, while we don't have much art from Jericho, these people a thousand years after Jericho, by now it's 7,500, they build Chatal Hyayuk in southern Anatolia. And this is truly a science fiction civilization. I mean, it's freakish. It's... 7,500 B.C., uh, the pyramids lie 3,000 years in the future. So uh, what about that? Well, we don't know. But uh, one, of the, one of the questions that will remain unanswered in this month is why. Why is there this synergy between the plants and the human beings. Is it chance? Is it just that this is how it works out and now we are self-reflecting enough to be able to unravel the threads that went into the confluence of uh, influences that created us? Or is it plotted somehow? And this is then the extraterrestrial gene theory. Is this thing somehow strewn in our way? Because you see, uh, I, I don't buy any of the extraterrestrial intervention theories that have them landing on the White House lawn or projecting images into the minds of people who live in trailer courts or all these things they're accused of doing. The one thing I grant extraterrestrial intelligence is great subtlety and probably a long time scale to do whatever they want to do. It's possible to reach a, a point of uh, deconditioning. It's a kind of reconditioning, but it's also deconditioning, where it seems obvious that the planet must be monitored. It is, after all, such an interesting planet. It seems that if anyone could monitor, they would. I mean, we've already now, through the probes we've sent into our own solar system, seen about 33 worlds. And they all fall into various classes, and not one comes anywhere near to what we are. We are what astrophysicists have given the charming acronym. We are a whore. A whore is a water-heavy, oxygen-rich world. And water-heavy, oxygen-rich is rare, 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 rare. So it may very well be that every one of these is closely monitored. Well, once you allow that notion, then the, the presence of the psychedelic genes, the psychedelic uh, activator in the environment, begins to look more like a, co a sort of biogenic engineering. <laughs> it is curious that what these psychedelics do on a on the scale of a community, is they release new ideas. You become the bearer of new ideas, or new tools, new techniques, new ways of doing things. And that this is how culture moves forward. That culture is a phenomenon dependent on the generation of ideas, plans, notions, connections. Well, this is precisely what these compounds are doing. So, is that a coincidence? Uh, or, or is that uh, <coughs> part of the regulator? Are we, in fact, somehow managed towards some point? And then the question becomes, of course, for what? And then, you know, 
it, it devolves into the realm of science fiction. I had a I had a professor once who had a fairly grim view of things, and his notion of what human history was all about was that uh, it was a uh, radioactive minerals mining project. And that when we finally had all these nuclear weapons stacked up like cordwood, somebody would come from another world and say, thank you very much. <laughs> this is what we wanted, and you've done a good job. <laughs> that all of human history was simply to get people to stockpile plutonium for somebody else's very good reasons. Well, I don't think it's anything quite so Jack Armstrong-ish as that. Because what I sense in the mushroom is a tremendous heart, a tremendous, you know, it's, all, it's well beyond all of that. It's, a, it's a, an emotional, intellectual, feeling-toned kind of thing. But is it a benevolent galactic monitor? Is it the beating heartbeat of Gaia? Is it this entelechy that I spoke of at the beginning of the hour that is somehow the sum total of process on the earth? Or is it possible that I have been uh, remiss in my assessment of the capacity of human beings and that this is nothing more than us? It doesn't seem to me like us. It, it doesn't look like that to me. I got into this game originally as a kind of an art historian. And art historians are, you track motifs over centuries or decades, depending on your bailiwick. And you, it, and what it really is, is it's the exploration of the human unconscious viewed as the, as art. Art. You learn what people have made, can make, do make in the realm of images. Well, the thing that was most astonishing to me about these high, high gain psychedelic states is how unfamiliar it is. How totally unfamiliar it is, even if you've made a study of the productions of the human mind in the visual dimension. So that it, it to me, and again, this may be my own psychology, what is always left out of descriptions of the psychedelic state, the deep psychedelic state, is how weird it is. I mean, a hair-raising oddness that adheres to it that is, I call, being in the presence of the other. The other wants to be as acceptable to us as possible. It doesn't want to frighten us. It doesn't want to appall us. But it's very hard for it to perceive what our parameters of expectation and bearability are. I mean, that's very, very clear. Uh, one of the things after years of smoking DMT and trying to form a metaphor for it, I finally realized that this place that I kept bursting into was um, the equivalent, it was somebody's idea of a playpen. It was somebody very weird. This was their notion of what a human being would feel most comfortable with. <laughs> and so it was, you know, rounded and enclosed, and there's a low hum, and it's white. And these uh, language elves that come hopping out of the woodwork to transform themselves... Those are the equivalent of what you hang over a baby's cradle. You know, bright colors, moving lights, that'll keep them busy. <laughs> well, and, 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 and it was a shock to me to realize this because I realized it profoundly. It's true. That's what it is. It's some kind of environment designed for a human being who has just been transported across hyperspace and is going to be observed for two minutes and 15 seconds and then sent back. And uh, why should it be that way? Does this really have anything to do with the spiritual life, or is this some skewed off other tack entirely? I don't know. There are suggestions, there are hints, but it by no means has the support of a broad river of tradition. For instance... Uh, the the 
56th fragment of Heraclitus, who's a great guy. I mean, Heraclitus was one of us. He'd be comfortable with this situation, I'm sure. The 56th the fragment of Heraclitus says the aeon, the aeon is a child at play with colored balls. This saying is 2,600 years old. What is it talking about? Who knows? But then you break into this place and you see the aeon and it's a child and it's playing with colored balls. And you say, my God, you know, it's like you're not meant to know this stuff. Uh, the, uh, the Kabiri in alchemy are the children that are generated in the alchemical process, not the homunculi, but these are the little elves of the metals that come out of the retort and can be seen dancing uh, in the fire. These, this archetype, motif, whatever it is, is hair-raising when you encounter it because it doesn't look like an archetype or a motif. It looks like a little man 11 inches high or a self-transforming jeweled basketball or an object from uh, another dimension. Very puzzling. The parameters cannot be known, or at least are not yet known. I mean, perhaps it's foolish to say the parameters cannot be known. We are like explorers. We, anybody who goes into this psychedelic dimension, we are all going to be go into the books as pioneers because it's too early for us to be anything else. There's no maps, no finished database, just anecdotes of the crazy, crazy stuff that goes on. That's why it's so important to uh, to try and share this stuff. Doesn't your comparison of... It sounds to me that your, the DMT experience, and you said other people have had very similar experiences with the language and the elves and all this. Does your comparison with that and other hallucinogenics... Um, help you draw a conclusion as to maybe this particular one is more off the wall and, and more... No, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a place that you approach by different strategies because a, a, a high dose of psilocybin will eventually put you into a place where you have to say, my God, I can't tell it from a DMT flash. And... A high dose of ayahuasca will eventually carry you exactly to the same place. The difference is that the DMT, it's, if you, the only way you can evade the DMT is mechanically. That means only if you take too small a toke will it fail. If you can take a big enough toke, it will deliver the goods. While with the psilocybin mushrooms, with the ayahuasca, you have to be a navigator. You have to know how to tack and breathe and descend and level and maybe a little mantric flash and dash. It's trickier. But, uh, but with the psilocy, with the DMT, you know, by God, you know, it has you, uh, if you get enough of it. It's exi you know, they used to say of, uh, during the Mughal dynasty, they used to say of the city of Isfahan in Persia that it was half the world because of the beauty of the vaulted ceilings of its mosques. Isfahan is half the world. Well, DMT is half the world. It's just, I would be totally despairing if it didn't exist because it holds back the premise of the mundane. The premise of the mundane is shown to be ludicrous beyond belief and not worth a moment's trouble. It's just ruled out of bounds, you know. The world is, I'm sure you've heard me say this, the world is not only stranger than we suppose, it's stranger than we can suppose. I mean, think about that. It is stranger than we can suppose. And when you sit down with a notion like that and let it sit in, you realize that any conservative habit of thought is totally skewing you uh, away from the quintessence of... Uh, and it's personal. That's the other thing. The world isn't this unbelievably strange thing which is out there. The world is 
this stranger than we can suppose thing which begins from the core of us out. That means nothing need taken, be taken for granted. It can be taken apart. It can be put together many, many ways. I mean, I really, you know, a, a, um, a short definition of Tantra, you probably all have some notion of what Tantra is, but a, a short definition of it is, it's the shortcut. That's what they say in India. They say, the premise of Tantra is that a single being can attain enlightenment in a single lifetime. That's the premise of Tantra, that in a single lifetime you could attain enlightenment. Well, imagine if you took that seriously, how much more engaged you would be with the problem of figuring it out. Because what if the only place you can figure it out from is a living body? And so you get 80, 90 years in a living body, and if you haven't figured it out by that time, well, then you're dead, and that's it. But during that time, you had a crack at the big one. There was nothing holding you back from figuring it out and then transcending such absurd notions as life and death and here and now. So it's like an opportunity. You get to walk out on the court, they pitch you the ball, and you have a chance to make an 80-foot set shot. And if you don't, into the bin with that one. <laughs> Os Janiger and I, who was a great old LSD researcher and runs the Albert Hoffman Library in L.A., when he and I first met, we were sort of testing each other, and he has a famous reputation for being irascible, and we just sort of were fiddling around. And then I mentioned DMT, and he just beamed and lit up and said, Now that's something, my God! And this is what everybody says when you push them. They, it's like <laughs> they admit that it is what it is, but it never occurred to them to go further, to look into it, to see what could be done with it. And of course, it's sneered at from two directions. It's called the businessman's trip, because it's so short. The old thing in the 60s was, oh, you can do it on your lunch hour. Well, what I want to know is, what business are these businessmen in? <laughs> because, uh... and then the other thing that was said of it was, it fries your brain. Well, that's a subjective statement about what it is like to have it happen to you. It doesn't fry your brain. The fact that it reverses itself in seven minutes shows that it is probably can compete with the world's five or six most innocuous drugs. Because that's a way of thinking about how your body handles a drug. My God, if it can return you to the baseline of consciousness in seven minutes, then it's just immediately uh, turning this stuff into harmless byproducts that go into the urine. It means it's safe. Well, you see, we're reaching scary conclusions here. We're reaching the conclusion that the strongest of all hallucinogens is the safest of all hallucinogens. That would carry with it a certain implication about doing these things. And yet, what is on the line when you do DMT is not your body, but your uh, maps, your structure. Your belief system. I, I, I don't, I've never seen it hit anybody quite as hard as it hit me, but I was transformed in a moment from a Marxist, skeptic, scientist. <laughs> I just, it, it was then, and I will say it still is now, it is pure 100% magic. It's magic. It's not a drug. It's an event. It's not something that you do, it's something which happens to you. And people come out of it saying, what happened? What happened? Saying, you did it. Say, that's what happened? I did it? You mean I just smoked this? That, that's it? Say, yes, calm down, the trip is over. You say, trip? You must be crazy to call it a trip. It's not a trip. It's a, it's a, it's an event. It, it's like being struck by lightning. Have you ever had one of these things? It's a lot like an automobile accident. An automobile accident is a very interesting <laughs> thing because you're going along and everything is ordinary and then reality just begins to unpeel. It just begin, and, and you have this very 
oh my God, I can't believe it. And it continues to go on, you know. I say, wow, it's really happening. <clears throat> it's exactly like that, you know. I mean, it just, it's just uh, a collision with another modality. On, I have uh, on DMT made sounds, the intensity and purity of which are immediately convince you that no human being could do this. I mean, it's just not the way humans do it. It has this synthesizer steady. I mean, I'll bet the wave is absolutely flat down as far as you care to look into it. It's as though we don't know what we are. It's as though this is the control panel in the human animal. And you discover, you know, the monkey form, the third planet from the sun, all that was a mere fiction. And the reality is this other thing. And then why is it, why does it have the character that it does? For instance, uh, both ayahuasca and mushrooms approach this place from different directions. But the, the DMT and the psilocybin have this unexpected science fiction aspect to them. This is what the art historians left out. This is what you don't get in Hildegard von Bingen. And you don't get the machines, the, the deep, iridescent, highly polished surfaces that are clearly made somewhere, manufactured. You don't get this cosmic viewpoint where the history of the solar system and the local history of the galaxy is being called upon to validate what is being said. In short, why is it so cosmic? It's different from ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a heart-opening, earth-centered, earth tones, uh, pastel, flowing water, organic form, fish in the river, mothering, canoe, animal-type thing. It's that even in Hawaii or British Columbia. It isn't the Amazon, unless the morphogenetic field is amplified without subject to the inverse square law. Well, this is really mysterious stuff that human cultural forms should be scripted into plants. What exactly is going on here? Uh, one of the things you can do with psilocybin and, and uh, ayahuasca that's very puzzling and should be studied is you can, um, when you get equilibrium in the state, uh, project a motif, let's say uh, Art Deco. Suddenly, there will be thousands and thousands of Art Deco objects Water pitchers, cigarette lighters, automobiles, hood ornaments, uh, sculpture, grill work, and then you can just instantly, you can say, uh, Italian Baroque. And in a single moment, you know, you're at the church at Santa Maggiore and seeing all this gold work and all this stuff. And then you can say, surprise me. So, you know, what kind of a dialogue is this? And what kind of an entity is this? Is this part of the spiritual quest? Is this off in its own uh, domain? The language of ayahuasca, a way in which ayahuasca and psilocybin slice it differently, is uh, psilocybin actually speaks. There's an informing voice. It tells you. The language of ayahuasca is visual. It shows you. You become like the eye of a, of a cinemascopic camera. And after a good ayahuasca trip, you just feel like your eyes are sticking out of your head. I mean, it's like going to Madison Avenue to buy art or something. You've looked at so many prints, and you've just looked and looked, and you've been looking and looking, because that's how it does it. And you know what I said on Friday about the more perfect logos, this thing which is visually beheld. See... What we're doing is we're mucking about in the domain of profound mystery. And I really can't help you. I don't have answers. I, my one answer is my little time wave, which I'm willing to share with you. But 
uh, ideas in this domain are a dime a dozen. I mean, my dream was always to catch an idea, because I saw that that's what the psychedelic thing was. And some of the ideas are tiny ideas, amusing and preposterous, but utterly worthless. And then the large ideas leave you just little, 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 little like that because they go by and tear your nets to shreds and your main concern at that point is to row for shore. But every once in a while there comes one of manageable size that you can actually wrestle into your little boat and uh, take back to astound everyone in the village with. And the time wave, I have the feeling that in the in the DMT ecstasis, that the time wave gets about a minute, uh, about three seconds, because they say, "Look at this." You say, "Oh wow, that's amazing." You say, "Look at this." You say, oh, "My God, I've never seen anything." Say, "But look at this," and each one of these are you. Your amazement is genuine, and your reaction is correct. You are being shown the most amazing things you've ever seen. It's simply that you cannot retain what they are. So the goal is, first of all, to be there, to know about it, to draw strength from the, the evidence for magic. But then the higher calling is to bring, is to, is to be a, a hunter, to find something, to bring it back. I mean, if that's a little too meaty a metaphor for you, well, then think of yourself as a noetic archaeologist. You, we want to bring back an object, a flower from hyperspace, a machine from another world. And apparently the easiest things to bring back are ideas. And so we have to pay a lot of attention because ideas can cross the barrier. Very little else can. But if we pay sufficient attention... I think all, uh, much of these ideas can be brought across, and we can bring all... Nothing is unfair. I mean, computer graphics, voice-operated tape recorders, uh, anything that works. I mean, the, this is... We've hit the main vein of ideas out there in hyperspace, and the goal is just to fill our knapsacks as full as we can and then get back to base with this stuff. <laughs> I guess really, I mean, I'm about to wind it down now. The real point of this month, and it, I have to keep clearing it back and reminding myself and you, is that we've discovered something and that we don't know what it is and that we're like the monkeys in 2001 dancing around the monolith. But this is important. I mean, that's almost all we can say at this point. But it's very, very important. The world will never be the same once the implications of this are worked out. And since I believe a lot of its impact is going to be in psychotherapy, and I see you guys as probably m many of you will be psychotherapists or therapists or doctors, you're going to have an impact and be involved in this. But basically, we're just clearing a space for a discovery and it's a hard discovery to announce because we don't know what we've discovered. We just know we've really discovered something. Fire must have hit with this kind of impact. And look how long it took to work out what you could do with it. Well, that's it for today. Thanks very much.